My name is Mike Gabin, and welcome to episode 13 of my KSP campaign. At the conclusion of the last episode, you saw me umming and eyeing over two missions, both of which were ready to fly. So obviously, this is the one that I chose to go with first. Uh, this is ComSat-1 on its way out to a circular orbit of 1,067.5 kilometers. Uh, and I'll explain why that particular altitude in just a moment. Um, the other mission being uh, another mission by the Otter One, which you'll be seeing immediately following this one. Uh, anyway, talk, let's just talk a little bit about the Delta V requirements. This particular craft at launch had 4,788 meters per second of Delta V. And by the way, when I quote Delta V numbers, I always work with vacuum Delta V numbers. I know that's not the most precise thing to do because Delta V can change quite dramatically, especially with some, some of the engines, uh, depending upon uh, atmospheric conditions. But I don't know, I just find it consistent to always look at the... Um, vacuum delta V. It, it just makes things simpler. But anyway, like I was saying, 4,788 meters per second of delta V. A little wobble there. Um, the budget? Well, uh, I budget about 3,700 meters per second to get into a low curving orbit. And then to get out to an altitude of 1,067.5. Ooh, that was, uh, those explosions of those boosters are pretty close to the launch pad. <laughs> I'll have to think about that next time. Anyway, um, let me see, what was that? Oh yeah, the, to change, uh, to transfer out to an altitude of 1,067.5 kilometers takes about another uh, 785 meters per second. So that totals up to 4,485 meters per second. So as you can see, I've got about 300 meters per second of delta V to spare. And the reason why I added on those extra 300 meters per second of delta V is because my ascent is... Uh, pretty inefficient because it is so steep. And the reason it is so steep, of course, is because of communication. Once again, I am playing with remote tech and I have to keep a line of sight. Whoops, there goes the fairings. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I like that anime. It's just too explodey. Anyway, I need to keep a line of sight with mission control in order to maintain control of this particular vessel. Um, again, that's because I am playing with remote tech, and in fact, the main purpose of this particular vessel, and three more like it that are going to be following, is to uh, make it so that I will have communication links regardless of where I am um, in a reasonably low orbit around Kerbin. Um, so, all we have left to do now is to burn up to our apoapsis, getting it in around 1,065 kilometers. And why don't I talk a little bit about why 1,065 kilometers? Actually, more precisely, it's 1,067.5 kilometers. Um, and one of the reasons I picked that particular altitude is because it gives me a period of exactly two hours. And that's what I'm going to be shooting for. I want a period of two hours. Now, why two hours? I don't know. It's a nice number. It's an easy number to remember. And the reason why I want an easy number to remember is because, as I said, I'm going to be putting four of these satellites up. They're all going to go into identical circular orbits of about 1,067 kilometers. 0.5 kilometer altitude. Most importantly though is not so much the altitude but the period. I want all of their periods to be as close to two hours as I can get. Um, the reason for that is because I want them to remain relatively in the same position to each other. Right? I don't want them moving at different rates around curve and I need them to stay equally spread out from each other and two hours is an easy period for me to remember. Now, if you imagine drawing a circle and putting four points equally spaced from each other, um, those four points would each be 90 degrees from each other, or using orbital parlance, their phase angles would be 90 degrees from each other. Now, imagine connecting all of those four points with straight lines. What you've ended up creating are four identical right triangles, and you can figure out how long uh, that line is between the two points or how far your satellites are apart using a little bit of Pythagorean theorem. Now, the radius of that circle is not 1067.5 kilometers because that's the altitude measured from Kerbin's surface and Kerbin has a radius of 600 meters. So the radius, the distance from the center of that circle to the outside, 
is actually 1,667.5 kilometers. So using a little bit of Pythagorean theorem, you can figure out that the satellites are actually going to be 2,358.2 kilometers apart. Now, why is that number important? Because that communitron that you see on the top of this particular satellite has a range of 2,500 kilometers. So, these four satellites, just using that communitron, will be able to communicate with each other no problem. And if they're equally spaced around the circle at any one time, at least one of them is going to be in a communication with Kerbin. Actually, here you can see the um, lines of communication. You can actually see the communication satellite's already doing its job. It's transferring out towards MAPSAT-1. So MAPSAT-1 right now has a signal, thanks to... Uh, ComSat-1, though of course that won't last. So anyway, the four satellites will all remain in communication with each other using just the communitron antennas, and then these dish antennas that are attached to it are for transferring the signal out towards the moon or to Midmus. So what we're doing here is we're just doing our final circularization, and what I'm really watching is that orbital period. I want to get that period up to two hours. The issue is that I am running out of fuel. Yeah, my planning didn't come out, and there it is. I am out of fuel, and a little more of two minutes still, a little less than two minutes still to add to the period. So this, quite frankly, won't do. Now, I do have a couple of contracts associated with this. One of the contracts is to take uh, some antennas and point them towards the moon and point them towards Minmus. So I'll take these two dish antennas, and I will do that. In the future, I plan on having um, a satellite on each side of Kerbin, always pointing at the moon, always pointing to Minmus. And oh, there's a time there. I'd have to have to be doing this for, well, I guess it was two days. You can see the timer clicking down there. Um, and actually, it turned out I have to not only have this go for two days, I had to maintain a communication signal for two days. So this didn't end up working out because this thing won't be able to maintain a communication signal for any period of time. As soon as um, the mission control, as soon as Kerbin rotates, so mission control is uh, on the other side of the planet, uh, I am no good. And this is my second contract associated with remote tech and unfortunately it's not going green it's saying i have to do four satellites but i need to get my eccentricity below 0 0.0040 and unfortunately my eccentricity is down to only 0 0.011 so i didn't get either of these two contracts working right that's kind of unfortunate but it is what it is um and you know this kind of brings up one of the reasons why I kind of play these games with no reverts and no no going back, no quick saves or anything like that. Because I kind of like sometimes these things going wrong. If you've been watching any of my videos, you'll notice that things do go wrong a fair bit. And I just kind of go with it. I like doing that. So I do have a plan on dealing with this. I'm going to have to come out here with a ship. We're going to have to refuel it. And we're going to have to uh, get its orbit where it needs to be. But as fun a mission as that will undoubtedly be, it'll have to wait for another episode. My, my actual immediate concern right now is what to do with ComSat 2. If you recall, ComSat 2 is identical to ComSat 1, so I don't want to run into sort of the same problems. But you can see it's over 40% built. So deleting it at this stage and restarting the build seems like kind of a waste of time in this game and in this game time is a resource as much as anything else just thanks to Kerbal construction time so i decided instead to keep comsat 2 in the building queue just build it normally and i do have a plan to make my launch more efficient to take advantage of the comsat 1 that is already up there but for now let's head out to the otter 1 and bang off this particular mission and as per normal, the Otter 1 is doing one of these uh, Kerbin survey missions, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this. Uh, this is something you've seen a whole lot of times before. The mission is to do three surface EVAs uh, on Kerbin. Uh, these three EVAs are all very, very close to each other. The locations are just a little bit to the north of the Kerbal Space Center. Uh, they are all picked up without incident. The landing area was pretty simple. And uh, yeah, it was just a matter of uh, landing at one spot and then driving around to the other two, picking up the surface EVAs. Managed to pick up also uh, a bit of science, a bit of temperature science, and a bit uh, uh, over the highlands. So uh, yeah, pretty routine mission. 
got uh, Jebediah back without any issues, uh, but I think now it is time to head on. Now, the completion of that mission allowed me to pick up space exploration and get the research started on that, and that also gave me another bill point for Kerbal construction time, which, as I've been doing with the last several build points, is I put immediately into the second assembly bay of the vehicle assembly building. And then it was just a 50 minute time warp to the completion of the Otter 2, my my newest jet plane. Um, and as we're time warping, you might be noticing that things look a little different. And that's because between these two missions, I had upgraded to KSP 1.04. And in the process, I also reinstalled all my mods from scratch. So uh, things are a little different. A little, uh, some of the mods have made some improvements. There certainly have been some improvements to KSP. Uh, we'll remove Jebediah and we'll put in Svetlana. It is her term. And we'll have this nice uh, sunset launch. And of course, uh, the reinstalling of mods meant that I had to set them all up again. So, uh, yeah, but that didn't take all too long. I got to uh, setting up Kerbal Engineer again and setting up the toolbars again. And after just a very brief period of time, we are ready for the inaugural launch of the Otter 2. And I'm sure everyone's noticing the most distinctive feature of the Otter 2 right away is that large rocket engine right in the center there. So I got two jet engines. The reason I got two is because uh, because of the extra mass that this thing involved. In fact, one of the things I really uh, was pleased with is I still have a 15 meter uh, width restriction on the uh, on the runway. And this thing, I had to do a little bit of tweaking with the wings, but I was able to get the wings to be just beneath that 15 meter restriction which I, I was pretty pleased with and pretty pleased with the way this came out. Now why the rocket engine? Well the jet engines are still the standard jet engines that uh, you get fairly early on on the tech tree and uh, I did get better uh, air intakes, so circular air take intakes at the front and I was hoping that the air intakes would be able to improve my high altitude thrust. Well they do not. If this thing still has that similar restriction it only can get up to about uh, I don't know, an altitude of about 10 kilometers or so. But, uh, so I was hoping I would be able to use this to get some of these higher altitude uh, curb and surveys with just the jet engines, but I can't. Um, so that's why it's got the rocket engine on it. So the rocket engine's purpose is to be able to push this thing up to an altitude of over 20 kilometers. And if you take a look at the contracts that I have over there on the right, you will see that one of them requires me to be a to do a crew report at an altitude of about of above sorry 17.3 kilometers so uh yeah that's going to have to be uh that is the purpose of this thing is to be able to get these higher altitude scans now actually the design itself is fairly reminiscent of how you would design a space plane uh until you get those those rapier engines which is quite a bit later on the tech tree. Um, with space planes, you kind of do a similar thing as this, except this thing has nowhere near the guts to be able to get into space. Um, what it really needs in order to get into space are better jet engines. I know that sounds ironic, but you need to get jet engines that can get me to a higher altitude. These guys can't do that. But uh, the idea is sort of the same. So once you kind of get better jet engines, you build something not too dissimilar from this, probably with more fuel and more mass on it than this thing has, and uh, you use that jet engines to get yourself some speed at high altitude, and then you use that rocket engine to achieve the orbital velocity. Here, though, that's not what's going to happen. Here, the rocket engine is all about uh, just getting that altitude up to 20 kilometers. And with all this playing around with this new plane, I almost forgot to show you the raster prop monitor is now working finally. Now, I do want to point out that uh, my previous issues with raster prop monitor had nothing to do with raster prop monitor. It completely had to do with me uh, probably being too aggressive with active texture management, which I did not reinstall. And that messed up the interior textures. But now they're working perfectly. And what's great about uh, prop monitor is that... Uh, is its integration with other mods. So on the left here, we're starting to get that ScanSat map 
that uh, that mapping satellite that I put up that previous episode. I'm starting to get that map, and you can see there's a little icon there showing exactly where I am. It also integrates in with Kerbal Engineer so that you can get uh, the kind of information that Kerbal Engineer feeds you. It actually integrates with a number of other mods as well, so it, it is absolutely fantastic. You can uh, you can set this all up to be feeding you the kind of information that you need so that you can actually do entire missions from inside the cockpit. Wonderful mod. And we'll just cut to picking up that final crew report again. This one has to be above 17.3 uh, kilometers, so I'm just waiting for the notification that I'm entering the right area. There it is, and I fire up that rocket engine and just point it straight up. That's all I want to do. I want to go straight up. I want to get altitude as quickly as I can. And I also don't want to travel too far horizontally because I don't want to end up leaving this particular uh, area, this waypoint. So this is just going straight up. And I will point out right now for those people that are interested in building space planes, this is absolutely not what you do if you have a space plane. Remember, getting into orbit is not so much about altitude, but about speed. And this is not the best way to pick up speed for sure. But anyway, my apoapsis is now about 18 kilometers. We'll shut down that one rocket engine I'll play around with the staging so that if I need it again I can get it back and now it's just waiting 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 we are now over the altitude we need we do our crew report BAM contract complete now it's just a matter of getting these myself back down so I'm waiting there we go we are now falling the camera gets a little bit messed up as we fall because I have it on chase mode I'm going to point it straight down onto that prograde vector. And Svetlana, not impressed. Not impressed with this at all. And of course, the mission now is to pull up before, uh, before we crash into the ground. <laughs> Which actually is not nearly as hard as it sounds. The only thing is that the air is pretty thin here, so I'm not getting a lot of uh, action off of my control surfaces. But as the air gets thicker, they start to kick in. I turn the engine off because I, I, I don't want my speed to get up too high. You can see I'm already getting some heating issues on the landing gears. I'm not really issue issues. They're a little bit warmed up. They're still in the green. And uh, there, we are under control at 11 kilometers. And now it's just a matter of getting ourselves back to the Kerbal Space Center. I'm a little bit surprised in all of that, that uh, during that whole process, those jet engines never flamed out, despite getting up to an altitude of almost 18 kilometers. Uh, I thought they would flame out. During testing, they did flame out while I was playing around with this thing, though I think I took it to a higher altitude than what I did just there. Um, for those people that have been playing Kerbal Space Program for a while and was playing with it, playing it during development, and building crafts like this, similar crafts to this one, you probably had that distinct joy of the asymmetrical flame out. Uh, that happens when you take your craft with your two jet engines like I have here, take it up to a high enough altitude that there's not enough air to feed the engines and they flame out, but they flame out asymmetrically. In other words, one of them turns off before the other one does, and then you get this asymmetrical thrust and you get this wonderful flat spin that put your craft completely out of control. For those people, I'm going to say right now, that doesn't seem to be an issue anymore. If you're worried about that kind of stuff, I would say don't be. I had no issues with uh, asymmetrical flameout. I did flameouts and uh, this thing was completely in control the whole time. I, I can think of two reasons why that might be the case now. Uh, one of them might be per perhaps squad designed it so that you won't get it anymore, that engines just flame out at the same time. Uh, but I think actually the more likely reason is is as you gain altitude you lose thrust and by the time the engines flame out they're producing so little thrust that even when you get the asymmetrical flame out it doesn't cause any instability in your craft so uh, that's kind of nice asymmetrical flame outs at least with these jet engines don't seem to be an issue anymore now uh, I am getting a little bit concerned about exactly where the Kerbal Space Center is. So I'm going to go and use the map in raster prop monitor here. So this is the ScanSat map once again. And what you can do is you can zoom in on it. And that nice blue line there, that's, that's my flight path that I did. And so all I have to do now is go back to where that blue line started from. I, I don't even need the map. You can see it's heavily pixelated as it comes in on the bottom there anyway. So yeah, I could tell that I was pretty much on track, which now that I've come back here, I can see yeah, there it is. <laughs> I didn't have to do that after all. 
Anyway, uh, landing wasn't an issue. Despite the ungainliness of this thing and its extra mass, it actually lands not that much more difficultly than the Otter 1 does. Its stall speed's just a little bit higher, so you have to come in a little bit faster, but landing wasn't an issue at all. And with that now complete, it was time to pick another contract. I decided to, to do one of these, more, rescue another Kerbin, Kerbal from, uh, from orbit to try and get a free Kerbinaut out of the deal. I decided to go mm -hmm, for this mm -hmm. rescue Ribful one, and not that there was really much of a difference. One of the things that kind of annoys me, though, about these uh, rescuing Kerbals from space contract is you can't see the orbit until after you've selected the contract. So now I can see that uh, Ribful here is in a really low orbit, but remember I did get the one with Tamley that was like in this crazy high orbit. So you really have no idea what you're kind of in for until uh, after you've picked the contract, which is kind of annoying. But anyway, all of that is going to have to be for future episodes. I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.